service it's wonderful to see you all uh, through the wonders of YouTube the sun is shining uh, well, it, it is today, today. Anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that come Sunday it's gonna look quite as nice but it's wonderful to see you nevertheless <laughs> yeah and it was really nice to see you all uh, well those of you who came along to zoom just before this is happening um, so it's so nice to catch up and just have a chat with a cup of tea just even if it is on zoom it's better yeah. than nothing so it was really nice to see you all so to kick off our service, we've got a wonderful song. Uh, you might think it's a kid's song, but it's got some wonderful words in it. And I think we can all agree that we want to be God's stars and we want to show the world his love. So let's sing uh, and worship together.
Today's reading comes from Genesis 8 verses 13 to 17 and then Genesis 9, 8 to 13. By the first day of the month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the seventh month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so that they, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, and those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good afternoon. It's very good to be back with you. This afternoon we are going to look at Genesis 8 and 9. Um, Noah's flood and his promise. The rainbow is our focus. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we open your scripture today, help us to apply its truth to our lives. And may we praise you for it. Amen. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? And what's on the other side? Rainbows are visions. They're only illusions and rainbows have nothing to hide. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers and me. Those are the musings of the great contemporary philosopher Kermit the Frog, one of the lead Muppets. And they focus our attention on the central image in Genesis 9, the rainbow. We're hard pressed to come up with a symbol or image that has wider appeal than the rainbow. Scientists, lyricists, photographers, the LGBT community and romantics are all drawn to this remarkable, remarkable optical and meteorological phenomena that causes a spectrum of refracted light to appear in the sky. When Droplets of water capture the light of the sun in a perfect manner to create a multicolored arc. I know there are good scientific explanations for what causes a rainbow, but who cares? We love rainbows. We sing about them. We pull off the road to look at one and we thrill at the capture of a rainbow in a photograph. Our Old Testament lesson for today recalls the wonderful narrative of Noah and the Flood. One of those Bible stories we feel we know about just as well as the Nativity account or the events of Holy Week. But in reality, we generally miss the point of this story. The most common mistake we make is to th simply think of it as a delightful children's story of animals in a houseboat and the appearance of a rainbow is a kind of all clear signal that the flood time's over. 
The other common mistake we make about this story completely ignores the children as we interpret the story as a description of a time when God was so discouraged by human rebellion that God in effect reversed the creation. That which God had pronounced good in creation is now seen as evil. Instead of holding back the waters to create the heavens and the earth, God allows the waters to flood the whole earth, wiping out nearly everything. Thus we have the story of a creator God now totally overcome by wrath and fury, ready and willing to reverse creation by destroying everything. Neither of these interpretations of Noah and the flood are helpful. A better way to understand the story is to see it as an expression of God's love and determination to restore the harmony that was the original purpose in creation. At the start of our reading today, the flood waters are receding. Noah's sending out doves to find out if the land is dry and habitable. After the destruction of the world by the waters of judgment, a man is offered, sorry, man is offered a new beginning. He's offered a world in which to live over, which we will have dominion and stewardship. God has not abandoned the world he made, even though man has brought disorder into his creation. God still gives his creative blessing. Now creation becomes grace in that it's unexpected and undeserved. And in chapter 9, we start with God's covenant blessing, words we all know well. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The divine blessing is given to all human beings. It is a mandate we all share together. This blessing also confirms that without distinction, all people are made in God's image. So we all share the mandate together. Life in the fallen world after the flood is that a life which is intended to be expressed in a corporate and shared human commitment. We're to look after one another and the planet. Even though we are wicked and we cause suffering, we nonetheless have the responsibility of being God's estate manager. Our choices influence the future. We can't duck our responsibility. God sorrows over the corruption of the beings that he made with such care and love. And God's heart, in striking contrast to the evil inclination of the human heart, is grieved by their betrayal. God is pained by the brokenness of creation. He sends the flood, then not as an act of revenge, but out of grief over the rending of human, right human relationship with God. Note that human betrayal of God's intention has effects beyond human beings. Human sin, sin has issued in the corruption of all the earth and therefore in its destruction. That destruction, of course, is not total. God doesn't wipe away creation entirely and then walk away. The flood is, in fact, the means of recreation. God washes the earth clean and both God and the earth begin again. All of creation is given a new beginning, a new opportunity to live in the harmony that God intended. Note, however, that this new beginning is also a continuation. God does not create new beings, but begins anew with a remnant of people created at the beginning. This brings us back to the covenant the sealing of a newly restored relationship between God and God's creatures. Note that this is entirely God's doing. God enters into an eternal covenant with all creation without requiring anything in return. God does so fully aware that the inclination of the human heart is evil. The flood has not cleansed the human heart of sin, but God knows this, 
and God enters into us a covenant with us anyway. Perhaps the divine heart that was so upset and disappointed by human wickedness that God sent a flood is now moved by that same grief to seek another way to get us through. So God promises to Noah and his descendants and to every creature on earth never again to destroy all creation with a flood. The sign of this covenant, God's bow in the clouds, is precisely the bow of battle. Ancient depictions of a deity armed with a bow and arrow are not unusual. To hang up one's bow is to retire from battle. That bow is in the clouds, is the sign of God's promise that whatever else God does to seek our restoration, destruction is off the table. And that's a relief. An implication of this promise is that God will seek us and seek us again and again, despite or perhaps because of God's knowledge of every sin, every grief and every shame that dwells in our hearts that keeps us from hearing the harmony of all life in God's care. God will not give up on loving us into restoration. He deserves praise for that alone. There can be few more wonderful and moving and dazzling um, sights than the brightness of a rainbow stretched out across the sky, particularly when set against the blackness of thunderclouds. There is a great image here that the hostilities are over and God has hung up his bow on the clouds. The weapon of war is transformed into our delight. God still loves us and his overarching care reaches out to us, reminding us of his ongoing care for the rest of time. For God, this means the suffering of divine love awaits our return. Despite all the uncertainty around us in this age, this still means that God has the whole world in his hands. We need such confidence and help today. In our world in which so many are given over to fatalism and are overshadowed by the pandemic or the intractability of economic and political divides. We live in an ordered moral universe of which the rainbow is a sign. This brilliant multicolored art stretches back to the themes of creation, to providence and covenant faithfulness. The rainbow is a sign of hope. We need to thank God that he's still in control and continues to seek us in love despite what we've done to this planet or to one another. What an amazing God we worship. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us. Thank you, Father God, for your rainbows in the sky promise that you reach out to us and won't destroy the whole earth again, but just such a symbol of love and care for us. We thank you. Amen. So for our prayers this week, it's been wonderful to have you send us suggestions. Uh, so over the last week or two, you've each been sending us in various things that have been on your heart to pray about. And so David Perriman is now going to pray through those requests and the things that are on our heart as a church community. Let us pray. And as we begin our prayers, let us pray for our nation and for our national life. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we live in a rich and privileged part of the world. And we thank you for the way in which, as a nation, we have been protected from so many effects of the pandemic through the wise implementation of lockdown, through the furlough scheme, through the amazing vaccination program. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for those parts of the world where these privileges are not theirs, 
and where the effects of the pandemic are so much more severe. And we pray that we and the other rich nations of the world may be generous and imaginative in the ways in which we seek to support those who are less fortunate than ourselves in the provision of economic support and in the sharing of vaccine resources. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for all those who've been affected by the pandemic, which is every person in the country. And we pray for us as a people, as we become weary of all the restrictions on our lives and for all those who are so badly economically affected by the continuing restrictions. And we pray for wisdom for the government in the relaxing of the restrictions on our lives and on the opening up of travel and that it may be done in such a way as not to threaten the future health of the nation. And we pray for ourselves that we may be patient and enduring and that we may have faith in you through this time of difficulty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the life of our benefice. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the imaginative provision that we have been able to enjoy and as restrictions ease we pray for the outdoor services which are to take place over the next few weeks and pray that those may take place safely and effectively and may be enjoyed by all. We pray for um, good weather so as to enable them to go ahead and we pray Heavenly Father for all the work that goes on with our young people, thanking you for Sam and Gemma and for all their uh, work with young people as well as support of other aspects of our benefice life. And we pray for the planning for the future and we pray for the drawing in of young people to come and know and to follow Jesus. We pray for our parish reorganisation as the effects of the pandemic are felt in the finances of the, this and other dioceses. And we pray for the process of incorporation of other parishes into our benefice, for Jan and for others working with him to enable that to take place smoothly and effectively without overburdening any who are in leadership and responsible provision of ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves and for our families, thanking you for the ways in which we've been kept safe from harm and praying for the continuing education of our children and as we come into the holiday season for the planning and provision of holiday activities for all members of families that we may all have rest and refreshment and be restored for the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for our local area and life and for the decisions that are made which affect our local life, particularly in this critical period for the decisions made about the possible incinerator on the A31 at Froyle and pray that uh, unless there's a really compelling reason why that's good for us and for our nation then that project may be prevented from proceeding. Lord in your mercy hear our prayer and Lord we pray for all of those who are sick and who need needy, for those who are in hospital, for those who are suffering pain, and those with other sorts of cares and disabilities. And in a moment of quiet, we lift before God those particularly known to us and mention them by name before you, Lord. The Lord Jesus was the great healer 
and he entrusted to us the continuation of his ministry. And we pray for those who have particular needs, praying that God would provide healing through our prayers and that we may be a support in every way that we can to those with needs. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we've come to the end of our service. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful having you with us. Mm. Uh, and before we go, Gemma's got some exciting news. 
Yes, I have. Um, <laughs> so over July, so the 4th of July, the 11th of July and the 18th of July, we are having outdoor services um, in the order of Binstead, Froyle, then Bentley. All the information will come at the on a slide at the end of the service and it'll be on Facebook and whatnot as well. Um, but part of that as well, we are planning some children's church informal gatherings as well, so we can reintroduce our children and our families into church life because it's been so long that they haven't been there for. And so um, that's what we're going to do. So the information will come out soon. Um, we are still planning the final few details, but um, get excited. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> so hopefully we'll see you soon at the outdoor services, if not before. Yeah. Um, so yeah, go yeah. in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, In the, the name, name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.